Okay, so sorry about that. I forgot about that. I always do. Thank you, Ian. So again, um, just a basic idea is that Jubilee School is a political education project of the Deck Collective. And what we're trying to do is to think together with our members and allies and other folks, indebted folks across the country, sometimes across the world, about the different ways that different types of debt intersect to create all different forms of exploitation, expropriation on a level, on a, on a variety of levels, whether that be in education, whether that be in housing, whether that be in medical, um, medical debt, et cetera. And what we're trying to do is draw connections between the ways that debt works as a mechanism of racial colonial capitalism and what we can do to both eliminate the debt and challenge the structures that produce it. And so a lot of our discussions end up being about not just about debt, but also about structural change overall. And one of the things that we find so inspiring about the current campaign that you're going to hear about is that in a lot of ways, uh, I would argue, and I think folks here would agree, the Massachusetts campaign that we're about to hear about was able to challenge what we could call the debt state. In other words, y'all figured out a way to fight and win for tax revenue rather than having to rely on debt to fund things like your universities, rather than having to rely on debt to fund your K through 12 institutions. And those costs being pushed down onto students, faculty and staff across the state. And so in a lot of ways, I think you have set a model for many of us to follow and learn from, and it's an absolute joy <laughs> to hear from you. Um, Ian, I'm about to lose my voice because the COVID thing is really killing me. So I'm just gonna say, Ian Rodenwald is a comrade and colleague oh. that I've learned a ton about through work with Debt Collective, also a union organizer in Western Massachusetts. You can say more about yourself because my voice is going and it's a real pleasure and thank you for helping organize this. Shanique, Max, Jen, I really appreciate you hopping on and doing the work that you've been doing and I can't wait to hear what you're all gonna say. We're gonna have presentations then we're gonna come back and I will monitor the Q&A. <clears throat> the last thing I'll say, is that when we get to, or if you have questions that come up during the conversation, please write the word stack in the chat. And then I can keep track of who's on the, who's on the list. Ian, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. And get some water. Um, my name is Ian Rodewalt. I am the uh, field organizer for the Western Mass Area Labor Federation, a coalition of uh, more than 60 uh, public and private sector unions in Western Massachusetts. Um, and prior to starting in this role, I was the Western Mass organizer for the Fair Share Amendment campaign. And that is what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, the Fair Share Amendment was a ballot initiative that we won here in Massachusetts last, last November. Um, and it uh, amended the state constitution to put a, a new uh, increase of all annual income above the first million dollars um, by a modest 4%. And that goes uh, is to public education, public infrastructure, and public transportation. Um, so if you make less than a million dollars, none of your annual income is, is affected by the new tax. Um, our panel this evening is uh, Max Page. Um, Max is the president of the 115,000 member Massachusetts Teachers Association, a longtime public education activist who believes that the quality of life in our communities depends on having public schools and colleges that meets, meet the needs of every student and family. Uh, Max was elected president of the MTA in May 2022. After serving two terms as vice president, he's on leave from UMass Amherst, where he has been a professor of architecture since 2001. Shanique Spaulding is the executive director for the Massachusetts Voter Table. Uh, Shanique has dedicated nearly a decade to organizing in BIPOC communities across Massachusetts as a social, political, and reproductive rights and justice organizer. With a BS in criminal justice from Mount Ida College, a native of Kingston, Jamaica, she brings to her work her lived experiences and passion for uplifting uh, and finding justice for marginalized communities like her own. She joined the voter table after delivering a hard fought win for uh, question one, the fair share amendment campaign as the BIPOC community director. And Jen Kaufman Ortega is an organizations and communication strategist whose work over the past two decades has spanned across the labor movement and progressive advocacy community at organizations um, Sorry, at organizations including the AFL-CIO, AFSCME, NEA, 
uh, uh, PL plus us revolution messaging and the Arab American Institute. Jen is based in Washington, D.C. and is a proud graduate of the Grady College of Journalism at the University of Georgia, has a Master of Science in Labor Studies from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and is pursuing a Master of Public Health degree in Health Equity from Boston University. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Max, um, who, let's, did he disappear here? Oh, th there you are. Uh, I'm here. You want, could I share my screen now? Yes. I'm in Great. Max. Hi, everyone. I'm going to try to go through a PowerPoint fairly quickly when I'm really excited. Um, I just really, I want to have Shanique's job, which is being a evangelist for the fair share amendment and our victory here. So uh, um, I think it's, I'm really glad that you're having this event and um, I want to just keep Keep sell, selling what we, I think, did did in the state. Let me see if this works. Does everyone see that? Yeah. Good. Okay. Fair share for Massachusetts. This is our campaign. Um, and I'm just going to start very quickly with my building at UMass Amherst, where I teach. Very quickly. This is an old picture of it when it came, built up. A lot of people don't like the architecture. But let me just tell you why I've come to love it. Largest arts complex west of Boston when it was built in the 1970s. What you're looking at is 646 feet of north facing art studios lifted up on those six pedestals for working class kids built um, with state and federal money built by unionized workers run inside by unionized workers. This was when Massachusetts was a far less wealthy state. We can imagine things like this, right? And we did this in a different time. Okay. If Massachusetts were a nation, how rich would it be? This is an important point. The imaginary Republic of Massachusetts would be the fourth richest per capita nation in the world after Norway, Qatar, Switzerland. So the notion of just like throw out the idea of like, do we have money for this or that? We have money. We have more money than um, needed for all real needs that human beings have in this commonwealth. Let's see if I can move on. Okay. As you can just see here quickly, personal income has like gone on up almost exponentially. And I guarantee you the population has not gone up exponentially just to see how rapidly wealth has grown in this commonwealth. See, there we go. Oops. Oh, something else happened. I'm not sure what happened here. Uh, I'm going to have to get out of here. Wait, are we there? Do you still see it? Okay. Yeah, we still see it. We have here. enormous wealth, and it is enormously unequal, as you can see. We are one of the most extreme levels of income in any state. Yeah. And just a very quick look. You can, you can look and uh, be disgusted at this picture. This is some of the wealthiest, some of the billionaires in Massachusetts, not only their net worth, but also how much their worth grow grew during COVID while thousands and thousands of people in the state were dying, dislocated, sick. Um, this is just to get a sense of how intensely concentrated the enormous wealth is in this commonwealth. Very quickly, also, just to give you a sense again, that's the income I showed you on that earlier chart, $600 million, billion a year is how much money is flowing. This is how much we spend on our K-12 education system, our vaunted, our best in the country K-12 education system. That's about 3% of the total income in the Commonwealth. Can you see that red line? I'm not sure. You might need a magnifying glass. That's the 0.3%. One third of 1% we spend on all 29 public colleges and universities in Massachusetts compared to the total income that we have. Just giving you a sense of how much we are actually asking of the, the 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 people of Massachusetts, especially the wealthiest, that was the situation. And, and if anyone was wondering about that phrase, tax Massachusetts, it's a myth. We are right down the middle of an average tax state. If you look at state and local taxes, that's the situation we came in on. This is the ballot from 1915, um, in which you can see uh, there was a creating. First, women's suffrage. It, uh, I know there's an X on the yes, but in fact, it did not pass. The men, the male voters in Massachusetts voted against 
equal suffrage for women. It, of course, the constitutional amendment at the federal level changed that. But you can also see that we created an income tax and the income tax was flat. It has to be a single rate. We are a flat tax state until last November. So I think Ian summarized it. We changed our constitution so that we could have at least one other uh, level to charge people. And we basically are taxing people only on their income over a million dollars. So all of you who make just a million dollars on this call, you can breathe a sigh of relief if you live in Massachusetts. It's only income over a million dollars, half of 1% of all households in the Commonwealth. And you can see it raises upwards of $2 billion. And this is an old slide. It was on the November 2022 ballot and we won it. I, we can go into this later talking more about strategy, but this is a long, this was, it officially began in 2015, but people had been working on this, talking about it way back. I was talking about it with colleagues back in the early 2000s at UMass Amherst. In other words, this has taken a long time. It required gathering of signatures among the population. The a Supreme Judicial Court threw it out. We can talk about that later if you want. We got it back on the ballot and we won in um, 2022. It went into effect um, January 1, 2023. Um, Raise Up is this in incredible coalition that has won universal sick leave and paid family medical leave, um, raised the minimum wage to $15. It's faith, community, labor. Um, I will just zip through this. I know I'm going very fast. We can come back to this in questions. Why we won, if I had to summarize it, we were persistent despite the ups and downs. This coalition stuck together and stayed with this, demanding that we get a more progressive tax system. This is really important. The public wants to tax the rich. When we started this in 2015, it was kind of equally divided and maybe a little more for what we wanted to invest the money in than in actually taxing the rich. By the time we got to 2022 in the campaign, more popular, the more popular thing was the fair share side, making the very wealthy pay their fair share. Um, although there's lots of skepticism of government, legislature, people cared about the core issues we wanted to invest in. Remember, this is taxing the rich to invest in public education, pre-K through higher ed, and roads, bridges, and transportation. People care about that. We built a broad coalition, really important. It was really Tremendous, difficult at moments, but really was a broad coalition of labor, faith, and community groups. I mean, I'll just say for the MTA, which we are the largest union in New England, and we are, you know, lucky to have, um, you know, the, the ability, especially along with our National Education Association colleagues, to spend what was necessary. And in the end, the NEA and the MTA together spent $20 million to win this. And as you'll see in a minute, it was well worth it. Um, for example, we now have universal school meals for every kid forever. No, like, do you deserve it or not deserve it? Prove your decor. Everyone gets it. Free community college. We're heading towards debt-free public higher education. That's the goal. But this is the start. Free community college for those 25 and older. Nursing students. There's $18 million for community college nursing programs. More scholarships for all, two-year and four-year um, um, you, public colleges and universities, more for public college, public school and college buildings, repairing them, greening them. Um, I will say this is not a budgetary thing, but in this whole process, we find the one in-state tuition that is paying the in-state rate for everyone, wherever you come from. If you live in the Commonwealth, immigrant or not, documented or not, you get to pay the in-state tuition. I think that made became possible because of the new funding. And uh, the Student Opportunity Act is a big bill for funding public schools, and we also um, were able to invest in that. So that I just zipped through that. I do wanna sort of end with some threats because I, I do wanna, what you just saw, all these amazing things, <laughs> these are all the first billion, one billion in the first year. So that's why I say $20 million is a huge amount of money. It comes from our members dues, but, it is paying off already uh, multiple, as you can see, 100, you know, whatever number that is more, uh, 50 times more. Um, okay, ongoing threats. Today, literally two hours ago, four hours ago, the legislature announced a tax cut deal and it gives back 
hundreds of millions of dollars to the very wealthy and big businesses. And I want to say it's a it's a trifecta legislature, all Democratic. We endorsed this governor. This is our legislature. And they gave $300 million back to very wealthy and big businesses. We can go on. There were some good things we won in there. But I just want to note that they felt like, oh, we need to do this to help out for competitiveness and prevent the rich from fleeing. So that's a threat. We have still have big loopholes for corporate tax havens. I won't go into the, there's a lot of jargon here. Sorry about that. But corporate tax havens, other things that are still in the tax code that privilege the rich and big corporations. Um, just a note that, as I said, only a billion dollars was spent this year. They are being very cautious. Maybe that's appropriate for one year, but it sounds like for another year, they're going to only spend a billion. So we are going to be really encouraging that they spend the full amount, which we think will be $2 billion or more. And then finally, there's always an ongoing question about whether they take the money and just sort of backfill. In other words, we'll spend less on education and then we'll fill in the money from fair share when the goal was, of course, greater investment in public education and transportation. And I will end there with a picture of a, one of our rallies. Again, what, this was a wonderful campaign that was based on an enormous investment in the field, but also we had what we needed to fight against Bob Kraft and the other billionaires with their their ads. We had equally in that. So I think that's why it really worked out to be a very powerful uh, campaign. And we're seeing the result of real tangible material gains to people's lives. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Max. I'm going to switch over to um, Shanique now. And all right. Hi, everyone. Shanique Spalding once again. She, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Voter Table. But at e as Ian mentioned in um, my introduction, is previous to working at the table, um, I spent nearly a year working on the Fair Share campaign as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, so that you can all see my presentation, uh, making sure that you can all see. this can i get some audible like yes i see this or not yes we do yes okay perfect just because i can't see faces anymore so apologies if you're talking to me and I don't see you. All right. So I want to talk about um the role of grassroots um and its impact on this campaign. Um but to start off, we'll talk about what my role was on the campaign. So I was the BIPOC um, Communities Director for the Yes on One campaign, the Fair Share Amendment campaign statewide. Um, and that's our Black, Indigenous, People of Color communities, which also encompasses our low income communities. The focus of the BIPOC Communities Director was to be focused on some of our uh, larger communities communities in the state, which we consider our gateway cities, uh, communities that all hold in a region. Um, so it's where a lot of jobs are. It's where a lot of urban centers are. Um, um, Boston, for example, is considered our gateway city. We have um, over 20 gateway cities in the state, and they predominantly consist of um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and low-income um, voters or white voters that are low-income. It's important to target that demographic because as we look at the statewide demographics, we have in Massachusetts a mostly white state, about 79% 70, uh, of the state is considered white, uh, whereas all other demographics fall um, under 10%. But it means that these sort of gateway cities, these urban centers are untapped potentials for votes. When we're looking at a campaign like the share amendment. We are looking at a camp up against uh, big businesses. And so we're thinking about who is this most going to impact 
and who um, passing this will benefit and who is least likely to vote if you do not have a conversation with them. And when we assess that ad as a campaign, that look like our gateway cities, that look like our BIPOC communities, where really the infrastructure there is like grassroots is everything, right? And so uh, we focused heavy on these communities, which is why my role existed. Um, and in my role, we also worked alongside not just our big unions like the MTA and SEIU and AFL-CIO. It wasn't just those union groups. We were also looking in those communities at our nonprofit C3 grassroots organization. In our states, our grassroots organization can engage in ballot initiatives since they're, they're not partisan. Um, to an a certain extent. So we invested uh, resources through the voter table to uh, C3 nonprofit organizations to knock on doors and talk to voters in those communities um, about the fair share amendment. And, and we also sort of worked the BIPOC communities um, department or my role coordinated everything with communications. It coordinated through our phone banking programs. We coordinated with um, our marketing and messaging. We coordinated through our business program as well about how do we message to this demographic of voters in every aspect of the work that we're doing. So we weren't just putting messages out that only resonated with some voters. We were putting messages out that um, resonated with most voters. And so the grassroots role on the fair share amendment. Um, so just giving you a little bit of overview of how um, this program and this grassroots work impacted the overall turnout numbers. Um, part of my work was also making sure that we had multilingual um Cam a multilingual campaign. So as I mentioned before, communications and marketing was a huge thing. Um, we did a lot of research around different demographics of voters, white voters, Latino voters, Latino women voters, college educated voters, et cetera. And we use that to work on how are we messaging on the doors and talking to people on the phones and how are we doing that on social media. So as we ran these door knocking campaigns in our BIPOC communities and low income communities, we were also making sure that we were doing this in a multilingual way. So I had hired folks that speak Spanish, folks that were Brazilian, folks that also were part of the AAPI communities. We had some of the largest multilingual largest multilingual campaign that I've ever seen um, in any ballot space in the state that I've worked on. And I've been doing this for about a decade. We had about 45 different nonprofit uh, C3 organizations on the ground in seven regions that were part of the Massachusetts voter table. Um, and they all coordinated with campaign staff um, to do outreach in their communities. That means that we had trusted messengers on the doors in communities speaking to them in their own language about the fair share campaign. Uh, we also had a huge pledge card campaign. Again, it was the same grassroots organizations um, at you know the local fairs, at the local Caribbean festivals or the Puerto Rican parade, talking about fair share amendment with folks uh, there and having them sign pledge cards that they then um, recircled back with these folks to remind them that they have pledged to vote. Um, our grassroots partners um, alone did over 100K one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with folks on the doors, and that um, reciprocated to over 80K votes for fair share. Um, of those uh, folks that they contacted, 57% are women or gender diverse, and 56.9% of them were um, BIPOC likely voters. Um, we also had multilingual phone banks. So we saw Spanish and Chinese phone banks were ran um, a lot. So we had folks um, just doing multilingual um, conversations on the phones with um, in our phone program um, and our predictive dialer program. So we were also running that predictive dialer as well, which is a big thing to see that happen. Um, and we also had um, a Spanish town hall. And the reason why we had focused a lot on Latino OAX voters is because we saw in our message testing, in our polling, as well as our early um, 
focus groups that we saw that Latino voters were our swing voters. So it was really part of my role of how do we message better in Latino communities? How do we make sure that we hire folks from those communities to be talking to grassroots partners who focuses on those communities and their turnout levels that we are messaging right? And we saw better turnouts that way. Some of our strengths. Um, we saw that nearly um, all of the gateway cities that we covered, um, that we had an increase in voter turnout for our question. Um, and it also sort of doubled the impact for the work that our unions were already doing in those communities. Um, Springfield, Chicopee, Holyoke um, are all places in Western Mass, uh, but we had Boston, we had Brockton, we had Worcester, um, Lawrence, uh, covering pretty much all of the gateway cities in our state. Um, Again, as I mentioned before, we had multilingual communication. Um, but what is most important about that is that that really we really saw language justice in this campaign in a real way that I have yet to see you know others replicate in a real substantive way. Um, and because we invested in this type of work, it meant that we were meeting communities where they were at. Right? We weren't just this entity like messaging on like these platforms that people. Uh, we're only seeing if they were in the know or they were politicals, right? We were messaging in places like the local block party or the back to school events where people are getting free backpacks in these communities or the Juneteenth events. Like that's where we were showing up to talk about fair share. Um, and, and the other things um, that was so important is that we started civic engagement work before campaigns and unions. So because we were we were working alongside grassroots organizations that already in community have conversations on the door with community, there was already this relationship that was built up prior to us being a part of a fair share amendment campaign. Prior to them coming onto this campaign, they were already talking to these people. So they were just going back to voters they already have a relationship with to say like, hey, we really want you to pay attention to uh, this ballot initiative. If you're coming out for nothing less, come out for the ballot initiatives. And it's very important to note that um, we had a sleepy electorate last year. And I think that what really drove people to, uh, to the polls were our ballot initiatives, um, especially question one um, for fair share amendment. So this last piece is for our data wonks. Um, I'm gonna have Ian drop in the chat this link that I'm gonna take you all to, but this is, I'm taking you to, um, the, I've done sort of a data analytics map system in which you can basically click around Senate and House districts in Massachusetts, community by community and see what the turnout numbers were. So I pulled up some things for you all to pay attention to. Um, you will also see that there is data on uh, question four, which was our um, driver's license campaign that was happening as well in Massachusetts, which a lot of our grassroots partners um, also worked on in tangent with question one. Uh, what's important to show is that places that we assume that we would just get votes, like community by community, like district by district, we saw some different outcomes. We saw in third subject, also low income white and some upper 54% turnout for question one, but then we saw that they came out for question four undocumented voters much higher, which is an interesting thing to see. But if you look at um, house districts here, um, you saw that in 11th Hamden, which is all the way in Western Mass in Springfield, um, where basketball was invented, is you saw that 64% um, voted for question one and 60% um, voted for question four. Now I'm bringing you, bringing attention to basically the demographics of these voters. I'm bringing your attention to the margin of these votes to really show you that grassroots work mattered, right? We are looking at 4% difference. We are looking at percentage difference that gave us a win. Um, overall, the campaign won around 60% of the votes, 
against the opposition, that's literally just over uh, the 50% line, right? And so what we saw was those conversation and that investment in the grassroots work was integral to getting small percentages in communities of, of a win to give us a overall statewide win. So for those of you who want to dig into the data, again, please um, look at it on your own time, click around, um, blow this up. Um, if you don't know much about Massachusetts, you can also just Google the districts and get like a demographic profile on that. Uh, the voter table is actually going to add some more profile dashboards on our website. So please keep continuing to look at our website, um, particularly if you dig into some more of the numbers for our, for our, our data wonks. Thanks, um, That's a quick and dirty presentation. I'm here to take all the questions. <laughs> Thanks, Shanique. I'm going to switch over to Jen now, who's going to give a, a uh, uh, overview of how this plays out in the context of other uh, nationwide um, uh, tax justice uh, movement efforts. Here. Um, and Hi, everyone. Uh, really great being here. Um, I'll share a very brief presentation because I want to hear your questions. Um, uh, but I'm with the State Revenue Alliance. We focus on building uh, intersectional tax justice campaigns that empower communities uh, to fund our futures. And when we talk about funding our futures, what we mean is um, generating revenue. And revenue is another way for talking about bringing money into the state generally through um, taxes. So um, we are really excited about what happened in Massachusetts, um, invested in like learning some of the insights from folks like Shanique and Max and then helping to turn those into strategies that can be shared with other organizations and communities um, and coalitions that are growing um, across the country. So just to recap, taxes are complicated by design, right? They're scary. It's very hard to figure out. You need you know, a PhD in some type of mathematics in order to really understand the nuances of like how things work. If it wasn't for like an electronic program that allows me to like, you know, kind of put in my, my information and, and get an answer, I have no idea how it happens. Um, and that's by design. Um, and there, it's really helpful to take a look at who are the entities that are fighting to make it so difficult um, and what they get out of doing that. Um, Grover Norquist um, and other conservatives are afraid um, that it would be easy, um, it'll be easier for like the, the feds to uh, raise revenue if like taxes were easier to accomplish. So they know that by keeping taxes complicated, um, it is very difficult for people to kind of see behind the curtain and understand what's happening. And what's happening is that, um, ah, what's happening um, is that, um, you know, we have a shrinking middle class, um, we have growing economic disparities and, uh, you know, the folks who are benefiting because of the complicated tax system that gives them all the write-offs um, are the ultra wealthy in corporations. And all of you know this because you're very well versed in this. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question. How much do you think was spent yearly on federal lobbying and donations by the top uh, corporations that paid zero dollars in corporate income tax? So talking about the top 50 corporations paying $0 in corporate income tax. You can put it in the chat if you want. I realize I can't see the chat, so I'm just going to tell you the answer. <laughs> um, over five years between 2015 and 2020, um, uh, uh, Jason was right that from 2015 to 2020, it was around $450 million. Um, and annually around like kind of 75 million, but what are they spending it on? They're spending it exclusively on keeping this tax code, ex uh, you know, complicated and to their benefit. Um, and so, and that hurts all of us, right? And that the folks who are benefiting from this are then using the money they save to lobby against our interests. Um, and, you know, what we really believe is that when corporations and the wealthy pay what they owe, as we can see what's happening in, in Massachusetts, communities have what they need to thrive. Um, and again, as Max said, this is incredibly popular, um, not just in Massachusetts, but across the country. So 
What do we need to expand this to other states? Well, we need to build integrated campaigns like the campaigns that Shanique was talking about that build support for tax justice. And what that means is multi-year campaigns like what Massachusetts did starting you know, in the 2000s through paid sick leave, paid family leave and kind of building up to um, uh, the amendment one question. Um, and um, it takes working together with grassroots organizations and policy organizations and unions to build these unified campaigns. Um, I think folks may have seen some of the wonderful photos coming out of the Midwest, particularly um, in Minnesota, where the governor is signing legislation to have, you know, universal um, uh, free lunches for students. And those wins weren't just of like what happened on election day, you know, the November prior, they were the result of investments in community organizing that started like five years prior. Um, and so um, that's not necessarily to kind of, you know, drive your hopes down. I mean, it, if anything, it's meant to like say that we all can do it because what it means is starting small, starting on the grassroots and building up is how you build strong campaigns to win. Um, one thing I did want to note is that, you know, Congress is tied up in gridlock, and that's not to say that we should not hold Congress accountable on this. Um, we should. And also, um, you know, at the same time, um, we need to be focusing on the state and local level and not forgetting about the importance of um, how winning revenue can make an impact in our communities. Um, you know, one other thing to note is that the Supreme Court is going to have um, a case before it around um, how income is defined and what can be taxed um, at the, by the federal government. And, you know, it's it's hard to know how that case is going to turn out. Precedent is, is on our side, but with this stacked court, who knows? Um, and that's going to make it even more important to have strong campaigns in place that focus on helping to build revenue at the state and local level. Um, and so, again, it's just about kind of continuing to share the wins and share the lessons with other communities. Um, I am really interested, um, uh, first of all, let me uh, highlight this one other win uh, as well. Um, in 2022, uh, Colorado passed a proposition HH. A lot of people didn't hear about it and it was not as like large a campaign as people typically see, might see or expect um, for statewide campaigns, or sorry, FF, not HH. HH is a, a different thing. Uh, Proposition FF. And um, it also ensured that there's universal free meals for students um, and is an example of some of the community building um, and focus that can start and then build upon it for subsequent campaigns uh, to continue this work. Um, in states highlighted here in a neon chartreuse type of color, um, <laughs> these are some of the states that saw legislation introduced in the legislature. Um, around revenue and taxes. Um, so some of these were wealth taxes, some of these were capital gains taxes, um, but this was a result of advocates and legislators working together um, to introduce these bills. Um, in most of these states, these bills have not had a committee hearing. So that means that there's still work to be done in terms of working intersectionally and collaboratively with other organizations to kind of help lift because of the importance and the interplay of, of, of revenue and taxes with so many of the other issues we care about to make sure that we're paying attention and helping to mobilize and build support for bills that are moving in our state. Um, th this was just eight states. We know that there are future states to come and we know that this is a multi-state issue. So it, the introduction is the first step we know that momentum will continue to build and we expect things in the future, but wanted to just really emphasize that it's going to take our advocacy and our pressure points because just because um, a legislator has a D behind their name doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do the, the right thing on their own accordance. Um, and um, let me go ahead and, and stop here because um, I feel like I'm repeating some of the stuff that has already been brought up very eloquently by the other speakers. Um, because I really want to hear folks' um, questions and, and make room for other folks to, to chime in. Thanks so much, Jen. 
Um, I, I'm going to start with a, a couple of prepared questions I have, um, but if, uh, if uh, audience members want to put uh, the word stack in the chat if as questions that you have arise. Um, and I, I want to start with um, how did the Fair Share Amendment campaign fight back and how, how do we continue to fight back uh, both against the billionaire funded opposition um, as well as, and, and you've touched on this a bit, um, as well as cynicism about change coming through uh, ballot initiative campaigns? I'll just jump in real quick. <laughs> um, I mean, how do we, I, a part of it is making sure we uh, celebrate the wins that we have. And this is already an issue. Someone said to me that they were, you know, they got praised, the legislator got praised for the universal school meals, but had no idea that fair share money had anything to do with it. So this is an ongoing effort to, when we have victories, let's make sure we don't just celebrate them once with one press release, but actually figure out how to continually um, lift them up. Um, and I, I guess I'll say that my hope was um, for this, that, and I still will hold out hope that it will come true, that opening this up when you say, hey, look, we did this thing that took 107 years to do, that is introduce progressive taxes in Massachusetts, what else can we do? We just we got new money for education and transportation. By the way, I didn't even talk about all the victories on the transportation side. So I because I was focusing on the education. If we can do that, what else can we do? What else can we afford? What else do people deserve? So that's that's my hope for the movement. And when we have these victories, it should go, oh, I guess we could do this. So anyway, that, that's my quick answer to that, Ian. Shanik or, or Jem, would you add anything? All right. Um, uh, and, and then sort of building off of that, um, what can we sort of continue to do to, to um, now that we've won the fair share amendment, uh, to to uh, pressure, as you mentioned, Max, the, the uh, Democratic trifecta in, in that um, is in the governor's seat and, and the... Um, uh, House and, and Senate to actually follow through and, and not do these estate tax cuts and capital gains um, cuts. So I'll, I'll plug in here. As uh, Max did a uh, presentation of some of the threats we still have on this legislation, it just goes to show that none of this is one and done. Um, so even if you attempt a campaign like this, there will always be a way that you know, as long as we don't have the type of representation that we want, whether you live in a progressive state or not, Massachusetts may be blue, but it's looking purple in more places than none. It does not mean that, you know, you have Democrats in the House and the Senate, and therefore you will get all progressive values. That has not been our experience. The fact that we have had this as legislation and could not pass it outside of ballot initiative is just a testament to that, right? Of that, you know, all that glitters is not gold. Um, and so what we spent this last year doing is ensuring and protecting those fair share dollars. So what we saw first was that the governor came out with her budget and it was like, OK, because we created a ballot initiative in such a way that we tied it to the Constitution, they had no choice but to give us what we said we wanted. Right. The the money in transportation and education was there. We seen it. However, we found where the loopholes were in our legal system and we started to demand that they fix some of that through the budget process, right? How do we cl close the single file loophole? Making sure that people who file jointly on the federal level also do so on the state level because that could be a way that someone who makes a million dollars in income based on a, uh, a couple's uh, tax filing on the federal level would also be paying that tax in Massachusetts, right? Is closing those sort of loopholes that exist. And so we re-engage those same grassroots organizations to be at the budget hearing, right? 
And one of the things that we're doing at the um, the voter table, and as Jen was mentioning about um, continuing conversations in the local community space, is budget advocacy is part of our priority. We are getting our grassroots organization more familiar with the budget process, not only in the state house, but also in their municipalities. If people are more engaged in every level of government, they are more likely to show up and advocate for themselves and for the issues. And so we re-engage our grassroots partners, we re-engage our union membership around, hey, here are all these loo loopholes in our tax system. We need you to be showing up to budget hearings and demanding that these loopholes be closed, that we fix the problem that we have at hand. And we're going to continue to make sure that we are um, holding people accountable, right? We are holding legislators accountable to what we have set in stone that the people have set in stone through a ballot initiative. We are not leaving it alone. We will be here. And whatever is unfinished this year, we'll be back again, bringing it back as a priority, back in front of their face until they know, just get it together, people. Get it together or you'll be hearing our mouths. I wanted to add two quick things to that. Um, one uh, is that, um, uh, reducing the ability for like high tax, um, high income earners to write off deductions. So can be an, a way, like an easier way to build revenue, but it's not raising taxes. It's just kind of eliminating deductions at the high income level. And that's a, a, a really helpful strategy to explore. Um, one thing I wanted to lift up. The second thing is that, uh, remember the slide where I had kind of like the three circles, no matter how you are moving forward, this type of issue, whether you're doing it at the ballot box or you're going through the legislature, all of those circles are important. They're equally important. So it's because this is like a year round, it's an ecosystem and it all builds power together. And so for instance, on if you're, if you're winning it at the ballot, you can't just focus all the resources and organizing of that electoral component it's also getting folks in the legislature, right? It's also continuing to educate and mobilize the grassroots. And so um, I think it, it was really perfectly illustrated by what happened in Massachusetts that the interplay is so important and, and, it, and it reverberates. Can I just jump in? I don't see any questions from the group yet. So I just wanted to add one thing because I know that maybe in the back of the minds of people who are from other states, oh, you progressive blue, deep blue Massachusetts, it's easy to do this there. That's not what Massachusetts is. <laughs> it's uh, It has a lot of red marbled throughout it. And this trifecta I keep mentioning, that's all Democratic legislature and, and, the, and, and the governor. Many of those Democrats are Republicans. They're, they're, they're not, uh, they're generally not radical right wing Republicans, but they're moderate Republicans. But they, the only way to move up in the world is to be a Democrat. So what I'm trying to say is this can be done in other states. And I'm so glad this the, the State Revenue Alliance is doing that work around the around the country. If you get beyond the the punditocracy, beyond the legislature, the people are always more progressive than the leaders, almost always. And they are hungry for this. And I think the popularity of unions, the UAW strike, there is just, a, if you access them in the way that Shanique and team did incredibly during this campaign, you find support for this. And it is not just about sort of a, oh, we can only do this in, in so-called progressive states. Uh, Jason, was that a, a question that you had in when you wrote Stack, or are you just urging folks to no, I actually wanted to ask another question. I, I really appreciate those points about because this comes up a lot when I talk about your win, um, especially with folks that are in, you know, red states, et cetera, or purple, whatever. And the people are like, and even in Pennsylvania, where I am, people are like, well, we can't do that here type thing. And, you know, um, so I really appreciate those points. I wanted to ask a question um, really related to the work of the debt collective and how our work might intersect because um I'm curious if when you were, you know, promoting and educating people about this campaign, if you talked about the ways that this is going to decrease the possibilities of people going into debt, mainly students, um, <clears throat> and how we need more tax revenue to avoid the debt trap, and whether or not you were able to use those two things together to, to, to win more people over to the fight. Um, because I think it's one thing that we in Debt Collective could learn from, which is to say, like, we focus on debt cancellation, but we're not necessarily focusing, like, as much as maybe we need to. 
on the other side of that, like, well, where does the funding come from in order to have some of the goods that we need that you all want, right? And so I'm just curious if you all brought up debt in some of the public uh, facing work that you did and how that played out, um, in particular yeah. with the BIPAC folks as well, because those are the most indebted uh, students and, and some of the teachers, you know, that suffer the most with debt coming out of grad school, et cetera. So just something on that, if you could. I'll just say very, very briefly, others will contribute. Absolutely. You know, and it's actually written in, you know, you know, some of this comes from polling and, you know, back way back when, when we started this, the 2015, 16 or so, um, that it was very clear that the, the issue of student debt and making public colleges and universities affordable was right at the top. In fact, when we pushed on the education issues, what is the most important issue? At that time, it was the student debt issue and making public colleges affordable. So that's, and that's what's written into the constitution. Investment in public education, we understand that as pre-K through higher ed, the affordability of public higher ed and roads, bridges, and public transportation. So I think that was absolutely central. And that's, you know, we in the MTA and, and our growing coalition and the Mass Higher Ed for All coalition and jumped right on that a month later and said, laid down the gauntlet for a true universal debt-free um, proposal called the Cherish Act. Um, thank you for posing a question, Jason, because it reminded me of something we did not say on the onset of this um, uh, presentation. So prior to us passing this, Massachusetts had a flat tax rate, right? A 5%. And so I'm going to bring you in the, the perspective of BIPOC folks, right? And the perspective of most folks, this is not even a BIPOC thing, is when you hear that you have a flat tax system, everyone gets you know, pay 5% uh, on their income to taxes, that sounds fair, right? Um, when I was messaging to folks, especially our grassroots organizers, which are, some of them are just like volunteers in these organizations. They're like, how do I explain why gradual tax is better than a 5% flat tax, right? And I said, here's the thing to think about. A person who makes a million dollar or more takes home maybe 20K a week. 5% on 20K a week versus your maybe take home of $1,000 a week. What they have left versus what you have left to spend on your livelihood. Food, we're not even going to get into childcare that you're paying for. You are in debt. You don't make enough after that, after you pay your 5% flat tax, you don't have as much left as a person who makes 20K a week. And so that's the difference. It's about the take home, not about the percentage. It's about what you take home. The percentage of what you take home is drastically different because what you take home is what you live on. And that's where you get into this conversation of building these campaigns around a livable wage. Because also you're gonna tax on what you make. So if we're not even at a livable wage, right? And you've got a millionaire who's making their income in different routes that isn't, you know, minimum wage, again, we see a drastic difference about what take homes is. So when we're thinking about that debt conversation, it's about what you're taking home. People are in debt because they're taking out loans for things that they need, a car. I need a car in where I live in my state to get to work. We don't have transportation. <laughs> you need a car and I can't afford a car on what I get paid. So I take out a loan that I can't pay because I don't have money. That's the difference. This puts you in a cycle of debt. And so it's important that people are paying their fair share. And that we're thinking about how we are investing back into community for those who can pay a little bit more. And that little bit more is still not as high as maybe the gradual tax in New York. It's still not as high, right? We are bringing people up to 9% and people are crying. Their whole California is what, 13, 14%? So much higher than what we did. I just want to say thank you so much for that. And we need to get that. We, we need to talk to you more about that messaging because that's exactly mm -hmm. spot on, like 100%. So thank you for that.
There, um, there was a brief question in the chat about something happening in, in New York. And Jen, you mentioned um, Invest in New York. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Um, Invest in New York is um, a coalition of grassroots organizations and policy groups and others that um, are, they have actually a robust agenda and campaign and really would recommend that folks who are in New York go check them out. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that there are around 25 states across the country that either have um, active campaigns or they're building campaigns that are going to launch in the future. Um, and so there may be places for you to connect with. And um, if you're interested, go ahead and check out our website and uh, join our mailing list. Um, we have maybe about five more minutes. Uh, we, we started a, a bit uh, like five minutes after the hour. Does anyone uh, else have any questions? Um, feel free to write stack in the chat or uh, raise a, a hand. Um, I have one or two more prepared questions, if not. Um, not seeing any immediate uh, stack. Um, I, I guess I, um, Jason and I, and I had talked about this before this evening about how um, the debt collective uh, focuses on um, fighting back against the austerity narrative that is in um, so prevalent throughout governance. Um, and especially what we're seeing in, in uh, with the West Virginia University um, uh, debacle right now. And I, I was wondering if anyone could uh, could talk about um, how combating the austerity narrative um, was central to winning the fair share amendment. Well, I'll just jump in that. I mean, that, yes, thank you, Ian. I mean, that's frankly the heart of our work. And I mean, our work in fair share, I think all of our, everyone on the screen is to fight back against that, which is an absolute core central foundation of the neoliberal world we live in, which is that there is austerity, when in fact, there's enormous, enormous wealth concentrated at the very top. So that is why I was saying the optimism or the hope that I had was that by undoing it a little bit, just $2 billion a year from people who will barely notice it, that we start to open it up and go like, well, if they barely notice it, why don't we do another $2 billion for housing or $4 billion? Um, So I do think that, that's, that that is the the goal. The goal is both showing the inequality and lifting up um, the demands, the needs that 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 people have, and and we're beginning to see, or we'll see in the very near future, that um, some of the states that have had um, uh, lots of extra in the budget to uh, invest in all kinds of things are going to see that they're having revenue downturns, and the reason why is because the COVID um, era funding and some of that federal stimulus is is about to end and it's about to expire. And so that means that um, because in the most recent legislature, um, there was a lot of giveaways to corporations. And so then what's gonna happen is that they're looking at a negative balance and they're gonna come to us and be like, oh, sorry, we don't have money to spend on schools and the thing you want, et cetera, et cetera, when that's not true. And I think it's like, it's doing exactly what Max was saying and also like really highlighting um, the giveaways and the corporations that are benefiting um, because they are spending, they're just choosing to spend um, on the ultra wealthy and on corporations and not choosing to spend on communities. And so that's really important to, to highlight as well. Um, and we have a question from Fred uh, who's put stack in the chat. Fred, do you wanna ask your question or is it what's written there? In Uh, the question is, what should we do if we cannot pay student loans? I, I guess I can say something about that from the debt collective standpoint. Um, Fred, we've been talking to a lot of people and we have information on our website about how there are different ways right now to get to a zero payment or lower your payments. And we're also organizing what some people are calling a debt strike and or debt boycott by doing so. 
Um, there are ways to connect with us about that if you go to our website and or you can send me an email and I can connect you with the right people about that. And we can talk about how to do that safely so that your credit doesn't get destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think the larger point thread <laughs> that's been brought up here today is that if we had a fair tax system, we'd have money to pay for public goods and avoid the debt that so many people are in, as Shanique brought up, just to survive on. And I, I just want to stress that again, that Massachusetts is is leading the way in this. And, and so far as the more revenue that comes in for the public good, and the more that the public's involved in deciding how that money gets spent, the less we all go into debt. And I just can't stress that, that enough. And I thank the presenters today for really making that point crystal clear and demonstrating like how to do it and the amount of massive work that it took. So much gratitude on that. Thanks, Jason. Um, well, we're coming about to an hour um, and uh, I, I don't want to um, take more of folks time than, than you had committed to. Uh, but I think Jason, you had one more thing at the, at the end uh, that you wanted to share. Yeah, I just wanted to say I wanted to thank you all again for the amazing work for coming on. I know you're extremely busy in presenting this. Um, I want to let people here know that this is archived on debtcollective.org and that you can also find out more about Debt Collective at our website. Um, we will have future Jubilee schools on things like how debt is a labor issue. In other words, how it hurts workers. We will have things on different alternatives to the university. And if you're in New York this upcoming Friday, we have a DJ set and a discussion about rethinking schools, a magazine, and how K through 12 schools are massively indebted and how K through 12 teachers are massively indebted and how we resist. So we'll have a session on that. And then we'll have drinks and a DJ for some disco to dance our debt away. Um, Cause we gotta have fun while we do this too. So thank you all so much. Uh, please connect with us <laughs> and really appreciate everyone's coming on and doing this work. So solidarity, stay in the struggle. Thank you. Thank you.